Well, good morning, everyone, or should I say good evening to Emily from Singapore and a warm welcome to this morning's webinar, Dementia, a Whole Life Approach, Technology and Dementia Learning Event. This is the Life Changes Trust second in the series of collaborative learning events, so look out for more announcements coming soon. My name is Alan Crockett and I'm the Director of Evidence and Influencing with the Life Changes Trust and I will be your chair for today's webinar. So before we get started, I want to go over some key points that were sent out to you in your joining notes. These will help, it make, these will help make this the best experience for you today. So firstly, could everyone have their cameras and microphones turned off? Just to let you know, we will be recording here in the main room of the webinar, but will not be recording in the breakout rooms that you go into later. Secondly, can you make sure you're on gallery view? You can find this option in the top right hand corner of the main screen. If you can see lots of people, you're in gallery view. If not, just click on that button. Lastly, we will ask you to hide other non-video participants. This will give you a better experience of our speakers. You do this by right clicking on your own little black box or anyone else whose camera is turned off and select hide non-video participants. I'll repeat that again. So you go, you do this by right clicking on your own little black box or anyone whose camera is turned off and select hide non-video participants. Thank you. And remember you can use the chat function at any time for questions and comments and we will take questions after our presentations as part of the Q&A. So thanks for bearing with us. I'm going to now very quickly run over today's very packed programme for you. We will be hearing from the Life Changes Trust Chief Executive, Anna Buchanan, who will be talking about the report we are launching today about technology and dementia. The report looks at the technology available to people living with dementia and carers at this time, what it is people are actually using and in what way. It also details what people think about technology and how important technology may be in the future for supporting families living with dementia. And with that in mind, how it needs to improve and be more accessible. Gillian Fife, who is Head of Digital at Alzheimer's Scotland, will introduce us to Adam, a brand new online tool which supports families living with dementia to find the right technology for them. This will be followed by Joyce Gray, who will update us on the digital work by Alzheimer's Scotland. Dr Donald McCaskill from Scottish Care joins us to talk about the importance of considering human rights and ethics in the development and use of technology and digital solutions to care. Later in the morning, there will be time to find out more about the different types of technology from the digital team at Alzheimer's Scotland during the SOFA Solutions breakout sessions. Today's webinar will also hear from Jerry who is living with dementia and Moira Murray, who will talk us through their experiences of using technology. And Ron Coleman will also join us to talk about how he uses Alexa to support him. And so yes, a very packed programme to enjoy today with time to ask our speakers questions in our Q&A section later this morning. But first, let's get started with a short film featuring Henry Rankin, Pat Woods and Geordie McGonigal. All who have a diagnosis of dementia. They decided to make this film a wee while ago now, but we're showing it today because it's about living and learning with dementia. They wanted to show that people who have a diagnosis of dementia can still do many things and that they can still learn many skills. They undertook some iPad training, learned how to speak to Google, and even learned how to make a film, this film. They were involved with the planning, filming, sound recording, and editing. I hope you enjoy this Rankin Woods and McGonagall production, which they have called The Greatest Story Ever Told. My name's uh, Henry. Um, I have uh, vascular dementia. My name is Pat and I've been diagnosed with Korsakoff psychosis. My name is Jordy. I've got vascular dementia, the same as Henry. When I was first diagnosed uh, <coughs> with dementia, I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want my friends to know that I had dementia. People come to the house and you're sort of the third person. That's they right. don't talk to you, mm -hmm. they talk about you. If they saw you, they would cross the other side of the street. 
stop us. Why were you interested in making this film? Um, the reason I wanted to make the film is to show the, the other side uh, of uh, people with dementia. We always seem to have negative stories and people with their heads sloping to one side and can't do anything for themselves. Um, I want to blow that myth out, uh, out the water. It's great the things that you can find to do that are different. Yeah. I went to Copenhagen. I'd never been abroad before. Mm -hmm. So I got a first passport. First time on a plane, first mm -hmm. time in a foreign country, mm -hmm. and everything was first. I, I would never think uh, doing something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, uh, the whole experience, the four day trip, and uh, the whole experience was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I met some lovely people. Yep. There were people from all over there. Yep. We laugh, we joke, and we can do things. And I, I think um, with doing an iPad training, I think you'll see uh, how we can actually use an iPad to our benefit, as well as other people, because it means we can keep in contact um, with group members or, or family. This is me going on to Twitter to send a tweet. If you go to the right-hand corner, you've got, uh, it's like a notepad and a quilt. Just press that, and I'll send my message. It won't matter at this point. Anything can tweet to me. Mm -hmm. When you've opened the app that you wanted... You laugh and joke together. So you uh, can laugh at yourself. Exactly, you know. Uh, well, if you make a mistake... Uh, but we shouldn't be frightened to make a mistake. That was uh, another thing. Yeah. We, we all make mistakes. Uh, in fact, show me a person who hasn't. What happens if that comes uh, up on your screen? Yeah. You just go back. Yeah, <laughs> the back button's good. <laughs> and if you want to tweet that, what do you I'll press? Tweet, I'll press tweet. And who gets to see that message? I do it so everybody can see it. And if we go down to, there's things at the bottom here. And if you press the heart, that shows you that is something you like. So you've liked yourself in a photo? Yeah. Is it all about self-promotion? <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> I think what makes this group far better than any other group is the laughter. You're still learning. You can still have fun, and they actually make it fun. If we are asked to do some, we'll do it, and we'll do it to our best ability. Very good, yes, Captain Very good. <laughs> We're challenging ourselves. Can we learn new things? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's good to do that. I think if you sat down and you did nothing, uh, mm -hmm. you would just fade mm -hmm. away. I've learned to use computers and email and things like that. And I never knew anything about these things before. I like going back in time, for want of a better expression, uh, when you can look up your school days, your old school, the place you used to come from. At my door, I did you pour back a bit? And I went, no, mama, no. <laughs> <laughs> I shortened the bindi knot. It was soaking, you know, the legs. The bindi cell was soaking. So you go into photos? And you've created the wee memories, memories file. And you found this photo. Were you just searching? I was just uh, browsing about and I came across this. It was a day as well as a competition between the two colleges. Mm -hmm. So at the, that time, the weather was a whole lot better. Seemingly, <laughs> seemingly. And I remember the first time I sent an email to my daughter, and she got a reply, said, well done, you. It's, if you have good people and are willing to spend a bit of time, you can improve yourself a bit. 
instead of just uh, yeah. accepting everything and going down that way. Made a lot of friends, good friends. Um, and as we've covered already, um, people are not judgmental. Yeah. Um, also, you, we see new faces. And um, if I've ever got a problem with the group that I go to in Falkirk, I always can raise it, yeah. you know, and somebody will say, I've done that, because it was difficult to get help. I think what you <coughs> find is there's laughter. There's, there's a laughter lot of laughter in these groups. Yeah. And people think, what the heck's going on there? Aye. And when they find out it's people, would say, no, surely not. That's Why? Exactly <laughs> Why? right. Why mm -hmm. not? We're the same as MDLs. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a disease called dementia. Yes. Um, but within ourselves, we're still the same person. Of course you are. Um, um, I'm going to show you a very clever little trick that I got shown. I discovered that I had 1,750 emails on the on the, the iPad, and I thought, no, I must get rid of these. I so we're going into your mail. A mail, and um, I pick a whatever. An email that you're not so fond of. That, that I hate, actually. <laughs> and then all you do is actually you place this rubber tip thing to the right hand side of the email, draw it across, and, and it, it deletes. deletes. And it also deletes permanently. This is it, there's a lot of first. I was, <laughs> I was asked um, uh, if I would like to um, do a bucket list. Uh, it was something that uh, I, I remember Alzheimer Scotland said to me, well, what's the ten things that you would love to do? Uh, my last one was to ride a horse. <laughs> and uh, it was like a big kind of cart horse. I could hardly get my legs around <laughs> on the saddle and my legs around it. I had a sore backside uh, for a couple of days after, but mm -hmm. it was an experience. The thing that affected me m more than anything was the fact that I had the hand in the car keys. Because that was immediate a, a, ch a challenge, you know, because yeah. I'd never used buses, because I'd been lucky enough to be able to drive everywhere. And what fun I've had, really, you know. Do you actually miss not driving now? No, I don't. I don't miss not driving. No, neither do I. Uh... No. Don't say no to anything. Somebody asks you, can you do it? Say yes. Oh, right. As if you can't do it, you can't do it. But aye. don't okay. say no just because you've never done it. Yeah. Try it. You might be That's good at right. it. Yes. I've, 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 changing people's perception of people with dementia is a good thing. Well, I think it's, it's, and I just like uh, I like to see the expression on their faces when they they realise that you're not totally You're daft. <laughs> I would say it's the greatest story ever told. Because we're telling a story. Um, how good it is, how you can uh -huh. make it better um, for other people that are listening. I like that idea um, just to prove, prove a point. You should be recording now. We never had this trouble with Fox, did we? <laughs> I tried to get out of um, doing the dishes. I said, look, I've got, I've got dementia. <laughs> my, wife says, my wife says, yeah. I says, but it doesn't stop you doing the dishes, so... <laughs> well, I've done that with hoovering. <laughs> Hello, 
Google. You do it, John. Yeah. I got it, I got it. That's his best features. Well, I'll do the oh, oh, in that case, you need to take the lens cap off. Oh. And then. <laughs> What does that mean? Hello? Well, no, it's, you speak garlic. <laughs> I think someone's telling you that's a bit stupid. <laughs> <laughs> he dies tonight. <laughs> but it'll be quick. <laughs> a garlic effect. Here is a magic video. <laughs> what does it say? I'm, I'm going out and add it. <laughs> 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 it's a bit messianic, but never mind. <laughs> Well, what a fantastic film and some lovely comments um, already coming through the chat from folks. Um, Spielberg, I believe, better watch out. Um, it never gets old, that film. It's funny, it's engaging, but really gives us some really important messages um, from Henry and Pat and Jordy around how people see people with dementia. I think for all of them, it wasn't just about learning to use the technology, but how they could use it to keep in touch with family and friends, to, you know, enhance their activities, you know, at home and abroad, and also just that wider connection. So um, without further ado, I'm going to move on to our second speaker. Um, we're joined by Anna Buchanan, who's the Chief Executive here at the Life Changes Trust. Anna will be talking us through the report we are launching today, Dimension Check Technology, funded by the William Grant Foundation. The report looked at what technology was available to people living with dementia, whether they could easily access or use this technology, and what technology they were actually already using, and how we can improve design and accessibility. The report also asks, is technology one of the key ways forward for supporting people living with dementia and unpaid carers? So I'm now going to hand over to Anna. Welcome, Anna. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Buchanan. I'm the CEO of the Life Changes Trust, and I would like to thank you for joining me today to look at a recent literature review and qualitative study that considers the topic of dementia and technology. I'm just going to share my screen with you so that you can see the slides. There we are. So the study was carried out at the end of 2018 by the researcher Robin Yellow Lees. It was funded by the William Grant Foundation and it was hosted by the Life Changes Trust. The first question we really have to ask ourselves, well, is well, why was this study undertaken in the first place? Surely there's enough evidence out there, anecdotal and otherwise, that says technology is one of the ways forward for assisting people with dementia and unpaid carers. After all, Scotland has a digital health and care strategy, and it is very clear that the strategy is about assisting people in terms of not just formal care, but informal care, self-care, prevention and public health. This assumes that increasingly people with dementia and unpaid carers will use technology to help them with informal care and with self-care. In early 2018, the Life Changes Trust conducted a preliminary scoping exercise to see what the evidence base was around dementia and the use of technology. 
There was some evidence that technology that would assist professionals had been evaluated. For example, technology that helps with the administration of medication or to make sure a person has not left their room or their bed and has not wandered off. But there was a lot less evaluation of technology that enables the independence and confidence of the person living with dementia or the unpaid carer living in the community. The evidence base seemed to focus on medical solutions more than social solutions and treated the person as a patient rather than a citizen with rights and freedoms. Therefore, an important element of this study funded by the William Grant Foundation was to better understand the evidence base on the effectiveness of assistive technology for people with dementia and carers living in the community. We know, and many of you will know this, that people with dementia, their families and friends have often reported anecdotally that assistive technology is enhancing their quality of life and their independence, and it is helping carers to care for longer, which means that people with dementia can stay at home for longer, which is where people need to be. Lastly, but really of first importance, this study is about hearing from people with dementia and unpaid carers firsthand about their experiences of using or not using technology and having a record so that others like you and I can draw on that evidence and add to it and use it as a baseline for discussions, for example, today. So the first element carried out was the literature review and we need to ask ourselves, what did that literature review tell us? So as Robin conducted the literature review, it was a bit of a challenge, to be honest, to find robust research findings about assistive technology. And where she did find research or evaluation, sample sizes were very small, usually far fewer than 20 participants in the trial or the research. The majority of studies had not included people with dementia in their research at all. And most of the research was carried out on prototypes and trials of products that were not available on the market. So at the end of the day, the research was of very little practical value to those who might want to purchase those products had they been shown to be good products. The literature review also told us some other things. If you read the full report, which is on the Life Changes Trust website, you will see that the literature review found that people with dementia and unpaid carers are largely unaware of how technology can help them. The studies carried out to date have focused on decreasing risk, for example, through the use of devices for monitoring or surveillance, such as sensors or GPS tracking. Devices are usually designed to stop something going wrong to prevent scalds, gas poisoning, fires, floods or injury. The literature review showed that carers were grateful for technology that took some of the stress away from their daily lives and some reported an improvement in their quality of life. People with dementia found GPS trackers either worn as a lanyard round the neck or as wearable technology such as a watch to be very enabling. This was particularly the case with people with dementia who are still very physically active and who want to be out about, out and about, for example, going on long walks alone. Other findings were that people prefer technology in the home to blend in and not appear to be medicalised. Call blockers were, wel were welcomed for reducing the likelihood of someone being scammed and simple devices that help with orientation, for example, what day is it, what time of day is it, is it the afternoon, is it the evening, is it night time, those things were very reassuring. People also appreciated technology that helped them find things, remember things or make existing technology such as phones and TVs easier to use. On the subject of scams and call blockers, the Life Changes Trust um, funded work on this with three Scottish councils, East Renfrewshire Council, South Ayrshire and Angus. The evaluation findings from that work, which are quite impressive, are on the Life Changes Trust's website.
So the focus groups were the second part of the work that Robin carried out. And obviously, I'm just giving a brief overview here for the full um, report. You, you need to read that um, for yourself. So Robin set out to hear directly from people living with dementia and unpaid carers. There were six semi-structured focus groups that were conducted in three locations across Scotland. Um, an advertisement for participants in the focus groups went out nationwide, but these were the organisations that responded. PCAVs in Perth, Perth and Kinross Association of Voluntary Service. Our Connected Neighbourhoods in Stirling and Curtis in Kirkintilloch. In each location, a focus group was conducted with individuals with dementia and there was also a separate focus group with carers. The study had been advertised broadly as focus groups discussing opinions about assistive technology use. However, participants didn't have to have assistive technology currently in use in order to participate. So there was a selection of people who were using um, technology and people who weren't. So a, a selection of just normal people doing normal things. The participants included 13 people living with dementia and 14 unpaid carers ranging in age from 46 to 90. Of those with dementia, two individuals were considered to be in the early stages of dementia, eight in the moderate stages and three in a more advanced or severe stage of dementia. Group members were given some pictures of assistive technology to prompt discussion, although it didn't take too much prompting, and focus groups lasted around one hour. Participants were given a gift voucher as a thank you for their contribution. So the groups were asked questions such as, what technology do you use? What is good about it? What is not so good? Why do you think people might not want to use technology? Have you ever decided that a piece of technology is not helpful before trying it? If you tried it and it didn't help, why do you think that is? Is there anything that can be done to make using technology easier? And if people who design technology were to focus on one or two areas or problems, what should those be? So, what did the focus groups tell us? Well, it transpired that focus group participants were already using quite a range of technology, although they might not have recognised it themselves. So things like community care alarms, call blockers, baby alarms, GPS mobile apps, satellite phones used like a walkie-talkie, um, drink reminder alarms, so quite a range. Many participants were very open to the use of technology. A key point to note was that participants really benefited from sharing information within the group and hearing about other people's experiences. Now, those of us who worked in the dementia world for quite a while know that that element of peer support is, is just gold. It's so important to have that exchange of information. There were feelings of eagerness to engage with and find out more about the options available. And this came through in questions that focus group participants asked their fellow focus group participants. They wanted to know how they'd found access to assistive technology. They wanted to know what did it cost? Was it useful? And um, there was quite a lot of information exchange. Someone even said to one of the other participants, well, I found it a bit useless, but do you want to have it and try it? So at each focus group, the information exchange was very prominent. A high number of participants said that they felt safer and reassured by the technology they used. And also they said that their wider family saw the benefits of the technology that was being used. And there was a general recognition that yes, technology can definitely reduce anxiety for all those involved. However, there was also a view that technology can be too complex, particularly in relation to setup and ongoing operation. Sometimes buttons are too small or the device is too sophisticated, especially for someone who is beyond those earlier stages of dementia. One person said it's just far too finicky if you've got arthritis. 
And someone else said, well, the power switch on that is absolutely tiny. You need a nail to switch the thing off. So this could lead to feelings of frustration or anxiety. But there were three key factors that really came through in terms of engagement with technology. First, there was a preference for passive devices. So that means devices where little to no action is required by the individual with dementia in order for the device to do its job. Secondly, it was evident that for assistive technology to be considered, it had to actually be the best option available. So if there was a non-technological solution that worked well, then people were less likely to try an assistive technological solution that worked well. And they didn't want it to perform a function that were, they were already achieving in some other way. For example, one participant from one dementia focus group saw that there was no need for an electronic display clock because his method of orientating himself was to look at his watch and to look at the date on his daily newspaper. Thirdly, in order for assistive technology to be considered, it needs to actually be a product that addresses a problem experienced by the individual with dementia or the carer. This might seem obvious, but there can sometimes be an assumption that devices will be useful to everybody with dementia. But what became very clear from the focus groups was that for each device discussed, one participant could see it being very useful and in exactly the same group, someone else could see absolutely no need for it at all. So one size definitely does not fit all, which is why conversations around technology are so important. Some barriers to engagement included lack of knowledge about the product's existence, lack of familiarity with technology in general and technological concepts, Quite a few folk made comments that they have to stop thinking that technology is just for younger folk and can't be understood. Also, as dementia progresses, there can be a marked de-skilling for the person affected. So therefore, not all technology is suitable for all time. Additionally, some people can engage with technology on some days, but not on others because their dementia is having a greater impact that day. Some people found cost or imagined cost to be a barrier to engagement. A number of carers said that they don't have time to consider new technology and it could be an extra complication on top of everything else they are dealing with. One or two carers said the person with dementia wouldn't engage with the technology because they were struggling to acknowledge that they had dementia in the first place. So timing for the introduction of new technology is also a crucial factor. When people are asked how to make it easier to use assistive technology, people in the focus group said first and foremost that they need more information in a format that is easy to understand. The information needs to be presented in manageable chunks and at an appropriate pace. They want to be able to see and hold products before buying them. So seeing and trialling products is important, and this is something that has already been introduced by Alzheimer's Scotland's Dementia Circle, which can be found on the Alzheimer's Scotland website if you'd like more information. Focus group participants emphasise the need for ongoing support from friends and family and from manufacturers. Many children and grandchildren were given applause at this stage in the focus groups. In terms of the development of future assistive devices, people talked about a need for some kind of assistive software that could simplify nav navigation on a computer. They also talk about, talked about simplified dementia-friendly apps that help them to actually use the tablet or the phone that it's on. So not an app that does something apart from the device, but something that helps someone to use the tablet or the phone. Participants also spoke about more products for entertainment um, and a comment was made that previously enjoyed pastimes were being left behind due to the progression, progressing symptoms of dementia. To have a much deeper understanding of what the focus groups spoke about and the findings from those groups, I um, recommend that you read the report that's on the Life Changes Trust's website. So a report is all well and good. What about the next steps? 
Since the publication of the Dementia and Technology Report, like all of you, we've been hit by COVID-19. So our original event for promoting it and for discussing technology more broadly had to be postponed. However, we're holding this online webinar today and we hope it will also be viewed by many people after today when the video record of, of what we discuss is put on the Life Changes Trust's website. What I hope will come from today is that there will be more discussion about what strategies can be put in place to address this real lack of information about available technology and the barriers to engaging with it and accessing it. The research funded by the William Grant Foundation provides us with a really solid baseline for doing this. We also need to discuss today how we can encourage technology developers, producers and retailers to recognise the enormous market that is out there for such technology and also the importance of co-designing technology with people with dementia and unpaid carers so that it is the best that it can be for them. Generally, I think we'd all agree that we all need better support to use technology. It's not just the case for people with dementia and unpaid carers. Um, we need to know more, we need to understand more, otherwise we're not confident to use it. Scotland's digital health and care strategy probably needs a slightly stronger evidence base so that it can undergird the ways in which it says it will be supporting people with dementia and unpaid carers. And it's our view the strategy needs to be an enabling strategy and not just focused on risk reduction. Lastly, and this is something that will be examined in far more depth by other speakers today, I am sure, it is of paramount importance that technology enhances human relationships rather than replacing them. Technology should never be seen as a quick way of reducing staff costs or dealing with the so-called problem of dementia. That is isn't the wrong perspective entirely and is a very slippery slope. So I'd like to thank you for listening. In a moment, you're going to hear from some of the participants in the focus groups that Robin held. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of this webinar and the rest of today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robin Yellowlees from the Life Changes Trust and we were interested in how individuals with dementia and their carers engage with assistive technology. There was about three different technologies being used within this room for people to try to locate the people that they look after. And everyone had its upside, everyone had its downside, but together people found the system that could be ideal for them and that was a great thing. My husband, having come into this room on his own, uh, and even when he was next door on his own, when I came back through, he was in deep conversation with someone, and they found out that they had a long association with Boys Brigade, and the more we were talking with people, the more you realise how much we have in common, and how much we can share and, and help one another. We found out a lot from our focus groups. Uh, one thing that came up over and over again was that no two dementia journeys are the same and therefore no technological solution is the same. And one thing that might work for one person wouldn't work for another. Often we found that people preferred passive devices, so devices that required no action by the person with dementia. These were things like community care alarms, GPS technology, uh, electronic uh, displays that tell time. I find it very helpful because uh, I have early Alzheimer's. When I came here today, people I hadn't met before, right? And I find it a very, very good thing. You're getting to know gadgets you could use, all these different things for Alzheimer's to use. We found several barriers to people taking up assistive technology. These were things like uh, not knowing much about it, being worried about if they could afford it, um, also worried that they might not have enough time to learn it, and then individuals with dementia being resistant to admitting that they needed an assistive technology device. Participants consistently told us that they wanted to be able to attend workshops and exhibitions where they could pick up and hold products and then perhaps trial them before having to purchase them. They also wanted the instructions for products to be simple 
and not to be overwhelmed with a, a large amount of information all at once. There was no feeling of, uh, you know, holding back or anything and people were, were very honest with it, about their opinions. We're so grateful to everyone who took part in our study. When it comes to dementia research, it's so valuable to have both the opinions of carers and individuals with dementia. Thank you, Anna. That was a, a really interesting and um, detailed presentation of what is a, a really fantastic report by Robin. And having been part of the focus groups and supporting Robin and, and them, um, it was really good to hear and be part of that discussion with people with dementia and paid carers and to see how much they valued being asked those questions and being able to participate um, around their experiences of technology and what works well and what matters to them. Just a quick comment from the chat um, from Emily from um, Singapore, who said that the result from the focus group is so empowering. So a big thank you to everyone involved. And I think that is a clear message is that, you know, that collaboration, giving people the chance to talk, discuss and debate is a really key part of research in terms of involving people with dementia and unpaid carers. And I think that the strong messages around the involvement both from the existing technology and their feedback, but also in how we design and develop new technology um, alongside people with dementia and paid carers. A summary of that report and the full report itself is available on the website of the Life Changes Trust, and it will be posted in terms of the post-event email that we send out next week, so there'll be a link to that on that. Anna will join us later for our Q&A section, so um, please, please feel free to put questions on the chat function and um, we encourage you to do that throughout the webinar and also during the coffee break as well. So it's now time to hear from Dr Donald McCaskill who's the CEO of Scottish Care about how to make technology human rights real. Donald has worked for many years in the health and social care sectors across the United Kingdom specialising in learning disability and older people's work. For 13 years she ran an equality and human rights consultancy focusing on adult protection, risk and personalisation. Previously, he worked in the early development of patient focus and public involvement work, the development of self-directed support, and before that, worked in higher education. Donald is now going to talk to us about the importance of considering human rights and the ethics in the development and use of technology and digital solutions, and the importance of accessibility and connectivity. So I will now hand over to you, Donald, and welcome to this morning's webinar. Thanks, Arlene. And it's great to be here, even if not physically present with everybody. And thank you to Anna for her words. As has been described, I ran a human rights organisation for a number of years. But long before that, I've been a little bit of a tech geek. I've always been interested in technology, probably since the age of 12, when I was taken to see at that time one of the fastest computers in existence in Scotland, which was in a room at Glasgow University. And I do mean in a room at Glasgow University because it took up the whole room. And at the time, the guy showing me around, who I thought was fairly ancient, but actually probably was just 40, said, but the time I was his age, everything in this room would probably be in the size of a cigarette packet. And years later, as people this week have explored the possibility of the iPhone 12, the truth of that and the truth of the reality that what that computer could do in that room can now be done a trillion fold in addition by that small iPad is unbelievable. But what I was interested in a few years ago, particularly in 2018, was what does human rights have to say to the way in which we have used technology and in particular the way in which we're going to use technology in the years to come? And so I spent a summer talking to people globally around issues of human rights, artificial intelligence, data and the Internet of Things, which basically is smart devices, which we all of us take for granted, like Alexa. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we came up with, and don't worry about reading what's on there, I'm going to pick out a few of these thoughts, but we produced from 2018 to 2019, we produced a charter with people who use technology, 
people who lived with dementia, individuals who designed systems, individuals who worked in health and social care. Next slide. And one of the key elements that we considered, sorry, if I can move to next slide, please. Thank you. One of the key elements that we considered was what was important to people. And what people identified as being critical was that all technology must have and must be used in a manner which is positive. And we've got to accept, especially people like me who are a bit enthusiastic about technology, that technology is not in itself always a positive dimension. There are negative ways in which we can use technology and digital, which limit, which categorize, and which remove people from interaction and relationship. So we have to be aware of that. In essence, therefore, we believe that technology must always be used to enhance the human rights of individuals. It must never be used in a way which enables control, which enables another person or the state to exercise any sense of intervention which is not the intervention of an individual. We said that we have to critically address issues of privacy and be really transparent. And I'll say a little bit about COVID in a minute, but I remain concerned that an awful lot of our technology, particularly our smart devices, particularly mach machinery over which we've got limited control is gathering data upon us. And I'm concerned that a human rights based approach to technology must have a very clear understanding of who sees, who uses, and who has access to the data which machinery, particularly smart devices, gather on me. Next slide, please. Anna has already highlighted this, and uh, we've very clearly in the development of our charter argued that technology must always be designed with the person in mind. This is not about using digital and technology to do too, it is to work alongside people. And therefore the best way of doing that is from the moment of having an idea that the person who is the end user of that technology is involved in the design of that device or that piece of equipment. And lastly, as Anna highlighted, at all times, we should make sure that technology is not designed and is not used to remove human presence, but is always used to enhance presence, to build relationship, and to make sure that people remain connected if they wish, and to remain as autonomous and as individual as they want. Next slide, please. So, it's been said that the last few months during COVID have dramatically changed the way in which technology has been used. And we know that. We know, for instance, the astonishing growth in the use of Near Me as a platform by which we can have a consultation with our GP, particularly in times where it's not always been possible to physically access a GP practice. We know that many people have discovered the joys and the absolute sins of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Skype and all sorts of platforms which have enabled us all to keep in touch virtually. But I do remain concerned that in this rush, in this enthusiasm towards the use of technology and digital as a result of the pandemic, that we have stripped out that ethical and that human rights dimension. And I want to reflect on that very briefly as I conclude. Next slide, please. So I don't have time to go into this, but my colleague Tara French at Scottish Care has developed a vision for technology and its use in social care. And it's very much a vision which she has worked on over the years, particularly with people with dementia, it's on the Scottish Care website, and I would encourage you to look at it. Next slide, please. It touches on the importance, sorry, next slide, please. It touches on the importance of practice and of experience and partnership. And next slide, please. 
But I want to conclude remarks by reflecting a little bit on the panel principles, which those of us who've been working in human rights for some time know as a model by which we can both test and evaluate any practice which is occurring. So the first thing about the panel principles is participation. Nothing should be designed or delivered which does not enable the participation of the individual. So from design, we have to have the person at the center. There is no point in having people dressed in white coats in science labs or more accurately dressed in, in jeans and t-shirts coming up with devices which actually do not meet the requirements and the needs of individuals. And during the pandemic, I lost count of the number of people who have emailed me and said, we'd like to work with you in developing this app and, or we've developed this machine, all of which sound great until you ask them, have you consulted? Have you engaged? Have you participated people living with dementia? And usually the answer is no. The second principle of panel is accountability. And that comes to the heart of some of the issues that I I'm still concerned about. So when NHS England was initially rolling out their app for COVID tracing, there were fundamental concerns over who would have access to an individual's privacy and data about where they were, who they were with, etc. So we have at all times to be aware that we need a very clear human rights based approach to privacy. And privacy is basic. It is, I have the right, and only I, about who knows information about me, not Tesco, not the NHS, not my social care provider. And I, and only I, can give permission for that data and that information to be used. I think we are slipping into a minimalizing of what we consider to be important about our autonomy. And I know all the arguments that people aren't really that bothered about privacy and their data. They may not be bothered now, but as scandals like the Facebook scandal show, it is when we discover that our data is used not for our own benefit that we might be too late to express concern. Critically, panel is about non-discrimination. We must treat people regardless of their characteristics. We cannot use technology in a manner which ill serves an individual because of their ethnicity, their disability or their age. And I've got real concerns that in our rush to the enthusiastic about digital and technology, we fail to recognise digital poverty. We have massive issues in Scotland around digital exclusion. And it's not just an age because we have more people under the age of 25 today unable to, to have access to smart devices than we had 10 years ago. Lastly, technology must always be about empowering within a framework of legality. It is about giving you control and autonomy and choice. And the last slide, please. When I did that work and I held conversations around the world in terms of robotics and whether or not we were imagining a future where in a care home, the delivery of care would be delivered by a machine. I gained an understanding which taught me that, yes, it is possible for a machine to do virtually everything, virtually everything that a human individual can do in the care and support of another person. But as Stephen Hawking famously said, just because AI, artificial intelligence, one day will mean that we can do everything, doesn't mean that we should do everything. So there will always be times in life where in the words on the screen from one of the key developers of artificial intelligence, where we have to ask ourselves, where is the place for human presence? And for me and my background, I think of those contexts of palliative care and end of life. Yes, a machine can hydrate me. Yes, a machine can 
keep me motivated, can help my memory. But do I want a machine to be present, to be the only presence at the end of my life? It can, and it probably will in the future, be able to hold my hand. But do I want a hand which is mechanical and cold or a hand which is alive and real to listen to my story, to hear my life, to feel my pulse? So a human rights based approach to technology always has the personal, the relational at the heart. We must always embed a rights based approach. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Donald, for joining us today. Again, as always, a really um, important message there um, around the use of technology and balancing that against the human rights of individuals and seeing people as people, and that technology really is about that added value. Um, I think there's some really strong key messages within that presentation that will all give us food for thought and really some key learning in terms of taking some of our work forward. Donald's presentation, I'm sure, will be shared in our post-event email, and I know that Andrina has put the link to the report that he referenced in the chat as well. I think um, we have to say goodbye to Donald, um, so a huge thanks again, Donald. I know that you're a very busy man and I get a very packed schedule, so um, please, a big thank you from us at the Life Changes Trust and from the people that have joined the webinar today for a really inspiring, but also um, a really important presentation around what we need to think about in terms of a human rights based approach. So now um, it's time to hear from Gillian Fife, who is Head of Digital at Alzheimer's Scotland. Gillian has been employed with Alzheimer's Scotland for over four years in various digital and technology roles. She became Head of Digital in November 2019. Previous to this, she worked for the Council for Voluntary Organisations in East Ayrshire, a strategic lead for social enterprise, building third sector organisations capacity in social enterprise development and employability. Gillian is joining us today to introduce us to Adam, a free online service which helps you to find technology products tailored to your needs and preferences. I'll let Gillian explain. Over to you, Gillian. I'm Gillian Fife, Head of Digital with Alzheimer Scotland. Today I would like to tell you a little bit about Adam, which is a new product that Alzheimer Scotland launched last week. It was Alzheimer Scotland's 40th celebration last week, celebrating 40 years of supporting people living with dementia, their families, carers and, and their community. And part of that celebration was about the innovation that's happened in those 40 years. We looked at things like dementia advisors, like post-diagnostic support, like our 24-hour helpline. And then we moved on to looking at some of the digital supports that we've developed. Last week, we launched three new products and we launched an appeal for our virtual resource centre. The new products that were launched last week were an Alzheimer Scotland app, which can be downloaded to your mobile phone and can be used to keep information handy that you might need day to day. The links that I'm showing you on the website will be shared with you after the presentation. The second product that we launched was Purple Alert. Some of you may already know about Purple Alert, which is our app which helps find people with dementia if they go missing. We encourage people living in the community to download the app to help become the eyes and ears if something happens, and families can raise an alert if someone that they care for goes missing. Recently, Purple Alert reached a milestone of having 10,000 downloads and we decided it was time for a major design and functionality upgrade. So we've added new features which will help tailor content to you depending on where you live in Scotland and how you use the app. Both of these apps can be downloaded from the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. But the one that I want to talk to you about for the rest of this session is Adam which is about digital and me. And Adam is a platform which helps you find the right pieces of technology at the right time. You can find Adam at meetadam.co.uk. And once again, that link will be shared with you after my presentation. 
Alzheimer's Scotland have been working in Adam for about nine months. It's been co-designed every step of the way by families living with dementia and by other practitioners who work in the dementia and health and social care sector. It was developed in response to a, a need. Um, people told us that they struggled to find the right time, the right, the right piece of equipment. They didn't have the time to look for the right thing. They worried about making the wrong choice, not being able to go back and change it, only having one chance to get it right. And they worried about maybe being misguided by people who were trying to make a sale in a, in a pressured environment. So we decided that there was a need to put together a trusted resource that people could go to and find the right thing at the right time for them based on their own particular circumstances. The development of ADAM has been supported by the Technology Enabled Care Programme from Scottish Government. And we've worked with a developer called Lumera Health to bring this vision to life. There's two different ways that you can use ADAM. You can browse the product catalogue. And if you can see my mouse there, I can just click on the browse icon. And you can see that there are lots of different products here that you can have a look through. And for each of those products, you can find out more. And you can find some more pictures of the product and you can find out a bit more about it and why you might find it useful. We also give you some information about how easy it is to use, how long it might take to set up and the cost and where you might go to purchase it. I'm going to go back now because I would like to show you the main way that we hope you will use Adam. And that's by having a conversation with Adam. If you tell Adam a little bit about yourself and the things that are important to you, then Adam will make some tailored recommendations for you about products that we think you might find useful. I'm going to click on the Get Your Recommendations button up in the top right here, and I'll show you how we do that. So first of all, you'll see on the left hand side here, we've got several categories. The first one, is a little bit about you so that we can find out some kind of baseline information that helps us to determine which products might be useful for you. And Adam also introduces themselves to you. And you'll see there that if you could hear them speak, they might be have a Glaswegian accent, even though they've spent a lot of time in Edinburgh, and they're also a dog lover. So we go to next. And then it explains that it just wants to build up a little bit of a picture of who you are and how you can how what kind of things that you're interested in so that Adam can help you. So I'm going to click on let's get started. So first of all, we would like to know what perspective you're filling the questionnaire in from. So are you someone who's living with dementia? Are you living with someone who has dementia and you're filling it in together? Are you filling it in with a family member of a friend who's living with dementia that doesn't live with you? Or are you filling this in for someone who has dementia that you support in a professional capacity? Professional capacity. So I'm going to fill this in from the perspective of someone living with dementia. And I'm going to click continue. And then we ask a little bit about where you live because that helps us to make some recommendations as well. So I'm going to say that I live with a partner or family and continue. And then just to get a feel of how much support you normally have. So I'm going to click that I sometimes have support and continue again. And there are some things just about your um, environment. So if you have Wi-Fi, if you have a telecare management system, or telecare or a care management system, or if you have other technology that you use to support your health. So I'm going to say that I don't have Wi-Fi, but I would consider getting it. And I'm going to click continue. And then we ask a little bit about how you keep in touch with people, particularly using a mobile phone. So I'm going to say that I have a mobile phone and I do have a phone that can use some apps. 
And you can see the little progress bar along the top here lets you know how far along this section you're getting. And then we're just asking about your views and technology in this one. So I'm going to say that I'm not sure about technology, but I would quite like to know some more. And I'll continue again. And I'm going to say in this one that I am OK with everyday technologies. And I'm going to say that I would like to do as much as I can by myself. And then we ask a few questions about who's round about you who might be able to help you. So the first one asks if there's someone who lives with you who's confident with everyday technology. So I'm going to say yes to that one. And is there anyone else close to me who's confident with technology but doesn't live with me? So I'm going to say I don't know. And is there someone who can help with setting things up and keeping things working? So I'm going to say yes to that one as well. And then we like to know a little bit about some of the challenges that you're, some things that you're finding a little bit more difficult. And again, that's just so that we can tailor our recommendations for you at the end of the session. So I'm going to say that I want some help with misplacing objects. I would like some help to remember things and I would like to simplify my environment. And I'll continue there. So that's me. I've completed the first section, the About Me section. And I'm going to go on and complete one of the other sections so that I can show you how you get the recommendations from Adam. So I'll click Continue. And I am going to choose that I would like to have a safe and happy home. And I'm going to fill in that section. You can fill them in in any order, so you can choose the ones that are most important to you first. So I'm going to now go to Let's Get Started. And I'm going to say that things could be better if I had help with using all of my house and my garden and outdoor space and reassuring my family that it's safe for me to live alone. In fact, I said I lived with someone, so I'm going to say making sure my home is safe and secure to be if I am alone. And I'll continue. And has anything happened that's caused me to worry about home security? Um, so nothing in particular, just feeling a bit uneasy, maybe lost a bit of confidence. So I'll click this one and continue. And has anything happened that's made me think I might come to harm? OK, so perhaps I've had an accident at home. I'm going to click continue here. And what are some of the main security challenges for me at home? So this is where we ask about things like answering the front door or getting unwanted telephone calls. So I'm going to say that um, I have a challenge seeing who's at the front door and knowing if it's safe to answer. And this is about identifying any other risks that I have at home. So I'm going to say that I don't always remember to switch things on and off and having lights where I need them and coming on at the right time. And I'm a bit worried about falling and getting hurt. Okay, so I'm going to click continue for that one. And that should bring me to the end of that section. So I'm going to say that I would like to finish now. If I wanted to get better results, I could go on and fill in more sections. But I'll click finish now so that you can see my recommendations from those answers. OK, so Adam has six recommendations for me. And what happens now is that Adam matches what we've answered in the questionnaire to some of these products and some of the functions of the products. So I said that seeing who's at the front door and knowing if it's safe to answer was something that concerned me. And so Adam has recommended this video doorbell that lets me have a look to see who's at the door and potentially speak to them before I decide to open it. As with the product catalogue, I can go in and browse so I can click find out more. And I can see some more images of the product. I can find out a bit more about it. I can find out about some of the other things that it does. We've got a section that says good to know, which are some of the things that you might not realise instantly by looking at the packaging or looking at a description of the product. And then we've got a guide of how easy to use, how long it takes to set up and the price. 
And if I go back, I can go and look at some of my other recommendations. And there's an, the next one down is a plug that can be controlled from an app or a mobile phone or a tablet that would help me um, remember to switch, it would help me be able to switch things off from other places if I'd forgotten. So for example, if I'd gone out without switching things off, I could use my mobile phone. And also if it's somewhere that the plug is hard to reach. And then we've got some options for some lights that can be controlled by voice or by an app, or can be set to come on and off based on temperature or a motion sensor. And we've got an indoor security camera. And then this hub, which joins a lot of these smart home products together. And we've got a watch here that would allow us to keep in touch with friends and family. So this one automatically can connect to your emergency contacts if a fall is detected. So that's the, the recommendations that Adam has for me. Um, this is our first iteration of Adam. So very soon you'll be able to log in to Adam, create an account for yourself. So you'll be able to save these recommendations and you'll also be able to share them with a friend or family, someone who might even help you set these things up. We're really keen to know what you think of Adam. And there's a, a survey on the front page. If I just exit this and if I scroll down to the bottom of the front page. We would love to hear your thoughts on Adam. So there's an opportunity for you to leave us some feedback. And also just finally, before we finish, I just want to point out that all of these products, which are on the Adam catalogue, have been tested by people living with experience of dementia. So nothing makes it onto the catalogue without having been used by families in a real life situation. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gillian. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again for the Q&A later after the break. So do put any questions in the chat. Um, for Gillian and for our other speakers this morning. I think what you've talked about today in relation to Adam really connects and links well to some of the key findings from the Technology and Dementia report, Gillian, about those bespoke solutions for people with dementia based on their experiences and, and the kind of functionality that they're used to in relation to technology. So really good to see that and, and to see that now being launched and um, being utilised by a number of different people in a number of different ways. So thank you. We will also send links to Adam and the other links that Gillian mentioned in our post event email, along with the links to the report, as I've already said, and the recording of today's webinar. So it's now time to hear from Joyce Gray, who's the Deputy Director for Development at Alzheimer's Scotland. Joyce and I have known each other for, I think about 10 years now, since John's joined Alzheimer's Scotland in January, 2010. And I'm delighted that she could join us today to talk a wee bit about what's new around digital in Alzheimer's Scotland. So Joyce, I'm going to hand over to you and welcome to you this morning. Thanks very much, Arlene. Um, doing this session live, I think I'm living life on the edge. I have uh, John in the dining room and uh, he's participating in a singing group. He's a community activity organiser with Alzheimer's Scotland. And I can hear him and I hope you can because he's singing, um, well, I'll just leave that to your imagination. The teenager's upstairs rampaging in his bedroom and uh, there's three dogs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually speak to my notes because um, I think I need to keep myself on track. So thanks very much, Charlene, uh, for asking me just to say a few words today. And I really echo the stuff that um, both Donald and Anna have already said. And Gillian has highlighted one of the most amazing initiatives that we've been working on. So here I am in my living room, uh, extolling the virtues of technology, which is very apt. And as others have said, I always preface our discussions around digital, you know, saying that we never want to replace our human contacts, but always just to augment them. But recently, uh, we've all had to prioritise digital over our human services. And we may have to continue to deliver services this way for some time. So it may be that some digital does allow um, for some amazing connections, 
like just now, as I know that there's songs to be sung at our music groups, new and old skills to be developed around personalised sessions, and maybe a new relationship to be kindled with digital, and one that we've been preparing for for some years. Um, at Alzheimer's Scotland, we've been working to incorporate the, the wonders of digital for six years, and we co-launched the technology charter in December 2015. I mean, that's my view, so I really kind of believe it's that long. And the charter set out actions to help people access and use technology to support their health and well-being at home. And just exactly what Gillian um, was describing there and the, the work that we've been doing around about Adam, I think that that's a, a really big step in that direction. That The charter and the work that we're doing then led to our extensive conversations programme. And the team who are all on this um, event today and will be presenting later, you've heard from Gillian and Nicola and Charlotte, they literally train thousands of participants across Scotland on the benefits of citizen technologies. And this led to the further commitment from Scottish Government around the Test of Change programmes that we're still delivering and that have led to all the um, innovation initiatives that um, we've been discussing. So as Gillian said, last week was really exciting. Um, we launched our first organisational app. We launched a newly designed Purple Alert Scotland. Adam was launched and the um, VRC Brick Appeal um, was launched as well. So as I said, we've always wanted to meet and greet those we work for in their homes and in our bricks, brick, um, in our bricks and mortar uh, buildings. But just now the show must go on. We need to stay in touch. We need to widen this for those who are not connected and enrich the connections for those who are. Some of these innovations, Adam, the BRC and Purple Alert, are world firsts. And we are really proud that our dementia communities in Scotland are going to access and benefit from these and also help us to develop them. So our relationship with tele technology is growing and our purpose is to shape it for good. And just as I finish, I've just always got an ask. I've always wanted to ask somebody to do something for me. And I would just ask that everybody that's on, if they haven't, that they would download the Purple Alert Scotland and help our community grow. And that's me. Well, thank and you, Joyce. Yeah. I managed to do that without any interruptions. You did well, very well, and, and a call to action as well at the absolutely. end. So well done you. You're absolutely quite right and, and good for you to have the platform to do that today. And I agree, I mean, you had a very busy week in relation to the, the launch and it was exciting to see every day on Twitter what was coming next and, and that kind of drum roll and that anticipation. So brilliant to hear um, that then being delivered um, by Gillian today earlier to explain to folks what it's all about. So um, I'm sure people have questions and comments from the panel um, session after the break. So good that you can continue to join us, Joyce, um, for that. So it's without further ado now that I say it's time for a short break. You'll be needing a bit of a refresh in your cuppa or your cold drink. Um, on the programme, it is for 10 minutes. So we'll meet you back here then in 10 minutes um, for Q&A. Enjoy your break. And thanks again, Joyce. Thanks. Um, nice to see you all and I hope um, you've got a fresh cuppa and um, a cold drink ready for our Q&A session um, and I'm delighted to see that we have Anna, um, Gillian and Joyce joining us today for our Q&A session. So I have plenty of questions for you all so I hope you're ready um, and just bear with me because I'm working between the screen and the chat function. So if there's a bit of a delay from one question to the other, then um, just be patient with me. So Gillian, the first question is for you today. So um, people want to know, does Purple Alert link to emergency services? For example, the Herbert Protocol in England, and I believe in Scotland as well, holds information about people to assist um, people who are maybe lost being found quickly. Does Purple Alert trigger a similar response? Thanks, Arlene. I'm also going to invite Joyce to comment on this one as well. But yes, um, we've worked very closely with Police Scotland in the development of Purple Alert. Um, and the, the information that's gathered within the app is, is taken from the Herbert Protocol information. So it's almost like having a digital copy of that information to hand. Um, one of the resources on the, the, our website, which sits alongside Purple Alert, are some toolkits for families to use. Um, and part of that includes a downloadable version of the Herbert Protocol form. 
I'll pass over to Joyce as well, see if she's in. Is there anything she would like to add? Yes, um, the, we're working on this just now, Arlene. Um, we're lo- hoping that there'll be a toggle that will just take us straight through to the police um, Scotland, you know, to their database. But if the person, um, again, it's all about permissions and privacy, if they agree for their data to be shared with Police Scotland and to be saved onto their database, we can do that just now for any existing missing occurrences. So if somebody goes missing, the police can actually, help, it helps them to build up a, a picture of where previous um, incidents of where somebody might have been found, places they might have wanted to go. So we can already do that, but we're still working on the iterations that the minute it goes off, it goes to Police Scotland. Because the way it works just now, I'm sorry, for my lengthy reply is that we would always ask people first to dial 999 and get that started and then press the purple alert so but it's very much a collaborative process and that police scotland's one of our biggest partners thanks joyce and thanks Gillian as well that's really helpful so anna the next question is for you so really interesting to hear earlier on about the importance of human rights based approaches to technology so is there a balance then to be struck between human rights and using something like GPS, for example? Um, I have to think about if it was for me, you know, or for others, it might feel like that sense of people being watched or that Big Brother's watching you. So, so what's your view on that? Well, as with almost every human right, um, there's always a balance to be struck, isn't there? Yeah. Um, I know that when um, one organisation and was looking at this in the Highlands, they actually got some legal opinion from a barrister. And what he had said was that as long as there was an understanding developed and written down between the person using it and the person who was monitoring it, that it probably was human rights compliant, but it's a gray area. I think it depends on the person's um, stage of dementia. It also depends on whether the person who is using the GPS has power of attorney for that person as well, because then they make the decision. But the balance is about loss of privacy against enabling. Just like it is with all of these things, we all sacrifice bits of our privacy in order to get something else. You know, we see it with this kind of thing. You know, that's and that's, I suppose, what Donald was talking about earlier. So there's not a straight out black and white question on that one. But what there is, is a straight out black and white issue of making sure we get the balance right. And if someone's being monitored without their permission, they don't even know they're being monitored. That's a it's a no-go if they um, have the capacity to refuse that if they knew about it. Thanks, Anna. That's really helpful. Thanks for, for explaining that to us. OK, so this is for everyone. So people, um, I can bring people in. Um, so what we're hearing today is that technology doesn't have to mean something very complicated. It can be about simple solutions. You just need someone a lot of the time to be that support and, and to provide that expertise. We've read a lot in the past about call blockers. So where can people find out about this? Anna, you might want to explain a wee bit more about that, given our experience and others might want to contribute too. Yeah, I mean, I think all of us will know about call blockers on the panel. Um, the best place, really, if you want to get an introduction into this is to go to the Life Changes Trust website. And we have an evaluation report of the call blocking scheme that we um, funded in three council areas that I mentioned earlier. So that would be a good place to start. And they have some tools on there that you can use to work out how you would, it's not just an evaluation report, there's some tools about where you would go to access um, call blocking. But really, if you phone your council, they will be able to give you information on it. Um, But if you're wanting to just access the issue and understand it a bit better, go to the Life Changes Trust website. And I don't know, Joyce, if you have something to add to that. No, just to iterate what you say, I think for, you know, either your website or to go straight on to your local authority to trade and standards. And they've got some excellent staff there that would give people support to get that you know, set up and started. Thanks, Joyce. OK, so now, Joyce, one for you. Um, your overview was really interesting earlier and good to see some of those initiatives that you've been working on for a long period of time now starting to come to fruition. So if you were a person that hadn't really used tech before, um, where would you start, given now that we're in you know, the climate of we can't have that face-to-face interaction, 
people can, you know, test and try out tech. So, so how would people get started? Well, for me, um, I have a teenager. So I don't know if anybody's got any teenagers that they can access because they're a very helpful and reliable source of information, um, how to get started and how to get, um, you know, some apps and some, you know, it's a, bits of kit that might be very helpful. But things like um, on our website, um, as you said earlier, you know, Dementia Circle, we've been working for 10 years. We've been, you know, like for people being at the centre of everything that we develop. Um, so on Dementia Circle, there is some, you know, um, information there. And now that Adam is here, um, he's going to be an absolutely tremendous help for people to put in questions where they think that they might have vulnerabilities and that they might want to um, use something and uh, use Adam. Um, we have, um, you know, things like now, like our app and, you know, also, I mean, picking up the phone, using our, um, our helpline, phoning a dementia advisor, if people want a bit of human contact, you know, so there's lots of different ways that we can support people. Have I missed any, to Gillian? I was just going to add that it's, it's not necessarily always about having something new. Um, it might be about using some of the things that you already have in a slightly different way. So it's sometimes just about um, exploring the different functions that the things that you already have. So it's something like your phone, for example, probably does a whole lot more than you you use it for currently. Um, and there are different ways that you can set things up. So it's not you don't need to necessarily start with something completely unfamiliar and new. Okay, thank you. Thanks both. And, and just kind of reflecting again back to Adam. Question for you, Gillian. Um, Adam looks really good, really impressive. Um, and, and really functional for folks, but is there support for people, particularly for people who might for the first time find it quite scary to use Adam? So is there personal support out there that, that can kind of take them through that, a bit like you've done this morning in your presentation? Yeah, we've tried very hard to make Adam really accessible. Um, and as, as I say, it's been co-designed all the way through. So we, we hope that it is um, you know, a relatively straightforward platform for people to access, but we know that not everybody has access. Um, and I, I noticed in the chat, um, Nancy talking about a survey from Citizens Advice about um, um, access to digital equipment. Um, so yes, yeah, so there are um, link workers, dementia advisors. Um, we're working with the Connect in Scotland programme at the moment, which is trying to get hardware out to people who haven't been previously connected. Um, and we have volunteers and we have our helpline as well. So there are lots of places where you can go for support. Um, and also, if you want to, you can you can complete Adam from the point of view of, of being with someone and helping them as well as being the, the individual. Um, all the questions are, are um, focused on the individual themselves, but you can you can work through it with someone. Great. Thanks, Shelley. And that's really helpful. People will appreciate having all those different options. So a question for everyone, and everyone, everyone might have a bit of a different perspective on this. So talking back to some of the things that, that both Donald and Anna mentioned in their presentations, do you think that people who design and make technology will now start to talk to people with dementia and carers to make sure they are making something usable for them? And I know, Gillian, you'll have talked and done quite a bit of this in the development of the work that you've been involved on, but, but what, what do you think as a panel Gillian, do you want to maybe start and then I'll bring in Anna and Joyce after? Yeah, of course. Um, our aim would certainly be to have people with dementia co-designing these pieces of technology. Um, what the difficulty is when you're talking about companies like Amazon, Samsung, Philips, they're massive companies um, and the, the percentage of people living with dementia who are users of their technology, it's not the primary market necessarily. Um, when you think about things like smart watches and things that they're, they're aimed at people who are exercising, who are going out and doing different things, you know, that are concerned about their, their lifestyle, their health, but not, they're not looking at it from a focus point of someone living with dementia. They're appealing to the, the more general population. So that's always going to be a bit of a challenge, but it's not to say that it's one that we shouldn't tackle. Um, what we have found is that where we have found someone who has had um, lived experience of dementia, where they've had a family member who's experienced dementia, the, the level of care that goes into the design of products really shines through. Um, so we've seen, um, you know, kind of some smaller organisations, things like um, the, the proximity 
um, device. Um, so Natalie, who, who um, developed that, has um, experience of a family member living with dementia. And the, the care and attention to detail that has gone into that is so much more. So I think sometimes the, the key is to find the right person within these organisations and to find someone who has that personal experience and understanding of what it means rather than just, um, you know, kind of looking at that, that more g- generic build of a product. Okay. Thanks, Shelley. Anna, have you got anything that you want to add? Yeah, I think it's part of a broader issue, isn't it? You know, that as we raise awareness about dementia in society as a whole, and as people better understand what dementia is, then we can then better interact with these organisations or with people who will become part of those organisations through their career development. Um, Just very quickly, you know, a number of years ago, about five years ago, we ran a, a thing called the Bright Ideas Fund which was a complete and utter disaster. And it was a disaster because the bright ideas that came in from a lot of tech companies, just when, when people with dementia looked at them, it, it showed a real misunderstanding about what dementia is. It was um, patronising and it was stereotyping. And to be honest, in that discussion, we got more ideas from people with dementia than we did from the bright ideas from the from some of the applicants, obviously not all of the applicants. So there is something there about being able to bring those worlds together. And that will take a bit of time. But in the meantime, you know, things like, you know, being done with Alzheimer's Scotland and others and pushing that up the agenda. We need a lot of advocacy around the right approach to technology and dementia, including the, the human rights aspects. Yeah. Joyce? Yeah, just quickly going to say it's our profile um, grows as developers of these innovation, you know, and the, the products that we get to pick the developers that we get to to work with and they really understand the issues facing people living with dementia and their families and that now like we're having a new developer for Purple Alert and the work that um, Gillian and the team have done with Lumera, they're getting a real understanding and it shows in the product. Thanks, thanks to all of you. I mean, we had a question from Colin that, that I think you've answered, but I'll, but I'll just say it again, just in case there's anything that I've missed. Um, he's asking how we can build scalable and sustainable mechanisms that allow people living with dementia to co-create technological solutions, because there are so many ideas and products in development. But I think from what you've said, you've answered that. I don't know if there's anything else that people want to add before we close the panel session. Just some final thoughts. Can I just add something to that, Arlene? I think... When we talk about scalable, we need to talk about what we mean by scalable. You know, do we mean scale up? Is that what we mean? Or do we mean scale out? Because they're two quite different things. So if, for example, you're taking, you know, Dementia Circle, for example, you know, that has a local base and then it's got a link, from what I understand, Joyce, onto the website. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if that was multiplied out to lots of local settings. You know, that would be something that scales out the way and would probably be more meaningful to people with dementia and carers in that sense, rather than something that scales up, if that makes sense. If I could just Thanks. add to that. Uh, yeah, of that course, Jelly. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that we're actually looking at um, actively because we we know that um, to maintain the the level of products on Adam, that we're going to have to to scale the number of testers that we have to be able to to feed these products into Adam, um, and to have them tested before they make it onto the product catalog. So we had been um, looking at how we. Um, make sure that we have a, a, a really concise set of protocols that people were able to be trained to develop, to deliver within Dementia Circle and how we facilitated training the trainers to be able to go on and do that. Um, obviously now COVID has had an effect on that because Dementia Circle was always a face-to-face um, group because it was just so much easier to be in the room with people and have discussions face to face and to be able to to touch and try and and use the different pieces, the different products. Um, But we're working on how we're going to be able to do that in a a more remote way and how that we can scale that up. So that's something that we we hope to have some news on soon. Thanks, Gillian. Okay, well, 
I have to say that's um, us at the end of our panel discussion. Um, we're running over time, but that's okay because it's all really important information and discussion and debate. So I want to say thank you um, to Gillian, to Anna and to Joyce for joining us today and for answering so clearly um, and in good time as well. So you're free to go, so I'll let you go now. So thanks again. Now it's time to move into our breakout rooms. So while um, our facilitators um, join us on screen, um, we, I want to just talk a wee bit about our breakout rooms for those um, that will be watching this after the live session, so the, the kind of recorded version. Um, what we're doing is we're going into breakout rooms that are called Sofa Solutions. Um, and we're going into four rooms. So one is about staying connected with family and friends. One is about getting out and about safely. The other is being safe and secure at home. And the last one is well-being and resilience. And we have four um, people from Alzheimer's Scotland who are going to lead in those sessions. So we have Gillian, we have Joyce, we have Nicola. I'm hoping you can join us on screen, Nicola. And we have Charlotte. So I'll just ask them all to give you a wave before we go into breakout. Hi, everybody. Um, so just a wee bit of background. In planning the programme for today, we reflected a lot on the learning from the Dimension Technology report that Anna presented earlier. The report did highlight that people wanted to know more about the technology they were using, but also what else they could be using in their lives to make it easier and to provide those solutions. It was also evident that the practitioners themselves wanted to know more so that they could better inform and support people in choosing technology that was right for them. So we decided that part of the programme for today needed to give people the time to do this. And so that's what we hope SOFA Solutions will do today. So it's now time to get into breakout rooms. We'll have about 30 minutes and then we'll come back here after that. Each room will have a facilitator that you see on screen as well as a member of the Life Changes Trust who will take some notes. So please feel free to ask them any questions and I will see you all shortly. Enjoy. Okay, that's great. So welcome back everyone. Hope you've really enjoyed the sessions and have stimulated a lot of your ideas and a lot of your thinking. I'm just going to talk just now while people come back and um, turn their cameras off. So I hope you found them useful. If you've got any further comments or questions about what you've heard in the breakout rooms, um, the contact details for Alzheimer's Scotland will be part of the post event email. So you'll be able to pick that up. Um, so if I can ask everybody that's come back from the breakout room now just to turn their cameras off when they get the chance to do so, thanks very much. So I'm now delighted to say that we're going to now hear from a family who are using technology to support them in their everyday lives. This is Jerry and Moira Murray. Jerry has a diagnosis of dementia. And with the support of Moira and Alzheimer's Scotland has been looking at technology that is right for him. So now I'm going to hand over to Nicola Cooper from Alzheimer's Scotland who caught up with Jerry and Moira last week. Um, and as I say, they've been on a bit of a journey trying to find technology that works for them. So over to you, Nicola. Thank you so much, Jerry and Moira, for joining me today to talk about how technology can be used to assist people living with dementia and family carers in their day-to-day -day lives. First of all, I want to ask you. Thinking back before you tell us about the technology you're using at the moment, how did you feel about technology in general? I felt the way it was actually holding me back. I was more likely to regress to older things like iPods, you know, and even, even t telephones, thinking about going for a really basic phone to see if that would make it easier. I just felt that even just looking at tech, it was actually quite stressful for me. Very I stressful. I didn't know what I was doing with it. Didn't it just as if it actually had passed about twenty years or something? It just seemed to have a big, big difference of it. For me, it was absolute fear, terror about the technology that's available now because it's just changing so quickly and so fast. And I knew that there was technology out there, but just don't know where to start and don't know where to to begin. You know and. We've got a few bits of technology, but we're not using it properly and we're not using it. And we just need guidance and, and, and what to do. And we're sure we both have real faith that it can, whatever's out there can work for us, you know, but not at the moment, not not until we're, we're sorted. So there is so much technology out there. 
How did you find that process of looking for the right technology to match your needs? Uh, well, uh, so I was given information by a person on um, a phone uh, that which I'm currently using at the moment, but the problem was that I hadn't been given all the information or someone to set it up for me. So that was that made it basically uh, practically useless. It became again a more of a headache. I mean, I've been told that this was the thing, so I went out and spent you know a few hundred quid on it, and then it just basically it always became as a it's been a pain, pain in my side. It's, it's just for until the last week when we got yeah. a few simple things sorted, and that's all it took was to, to start the ball rolling again. It, yeah. That few simple things that you helped us with last week just changed. It became a big, it became a big help, didn't yeah, it? You yeah, know, just yeah. and we just didn't know, you know, or, you know, we just didn't know that that's all you had to do was to take it off, yeah. you know. And there's the technology's there, but if you don't know how to, it's like you know, it's no point in having a big fancy yeah. car sitting in the drive if you don't know how to drive it. Yeah. You know, and we don't know how to drive the technology that's available at the moment, and that's what we need guidance on. Yeah. You know, I think. Yeah, I think just as you say there, I think the thing is, it's, it's out there, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit like we're seeing you with computers and IT. It's like having somebody that goes specifically to that person and sets up for that person, you know, and have a one to one on it until you get it right. Because I think what somebody, what something, the same thing doesn't work again for the, another person because they might have different, different okay. ways of looking at it. I don't know. It's, I think. I think in the, the world of Alzheimer's and dementia, we're quite young. And I think it must be terrifying for other people, you know, for older people who are even a generation older than us, who didn't have the technology that we've had, you know, um, and our kids have had that technology and so brought it into the house. Older people haven't had that, you know, so it must, it must be even more terrifying for them. So just that, you just become, you just put up a wall and just say no and just live, you know, isolation and yeah. when it when there's so many things like, you know, Zoom calls and things like this that can put you in touch with people, yeah. you know, that we've been reluctant. We've just yeah. become, I think, just putting up barriers and just saying no, you know, but yeah. not now. Well, before, <laughs> before when the phone rings, basically, I just kind of I hand it on to somebody and hope they can answer it for me. And that's, that's even when I'm out, you know, so it's, um, it makes it less... Um, personal that you have that then because you, you're basically not using it to, uh, to the extent you should be able to use it you know it's just and it's just mm -hmm. it, it really messes with your head um, so tell me about the technology you're using just now your phone jerry what sort of things do you use it for uh, Generally, obviously, if I can get a, a call out and a call back to me, it's just it's handy for me. Obviously, if my wife's trying to con my wife's trying to contact me, and we're trying to contact each other. You know, I don't want to get if I get um, waylaid or uh, over, you know, go out for a bit of walk for a bit longer than that. You know, and then she maybe get worried. And then so if I can't contact her then, or she can't contact me, then it, it, it causes stress within you know persons. But we use the technology, the technology that's available and we can use it, we hope to use it for everything, you know, like, um, because I'm doing more and more for Jerry, I'm forgetting things all the time, so I need to start reminding myself, you know, putting writing things down and I, I, I've got, you know, bits of paper that I write things down on all over the house, you know, um, I think I could probably start using um, or something. My, well, you putting my phone to better use, putting the technology that's out there to better use. Um, but we use it. But I use it for looking up everything, you know. Mm. But because we've got the added sort of problem in, in the, with my hearing impairment and Jerry's visual impairment, we're trying to find something that can help us both. You know, and um, so like Jerry can't just phone me, he's got to text me and he's got to work out how to be able to send a text with his phone and not being able to see the keypad and we've got to use voice technology. So that's the sort of thing that we're hoping, you know, that, that it'll work for better yeah. once we get it working properly, much more practice. 
Thank you. So would you say it's made a difference to your life so far? Uh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, just that usage of my phone is, is much easier. You know, we've had someone looking at technology that we had and how you use it better. So it's, so it's just a matter now of just basically, you know, keeping on it, you know, and for trying me trying to remember it, you know, uh, but I, I'm definitely using it more uh, than I initially did. I mean, I was basically, was basically just wanting to stick it under the pillow in the bed and just hoped it didn't ring because it just feels <laughs> like you've got to call it back, you know, so uh, it's, it's just te technology is difficult, you know. It's, I, mean, I mean, the thing is, you look at your kids now and your kids are actually all doing thousands of things at the same time and you kind of look at them and it's you just feel a bit um, I've never gone that you're a bit lost <laughs> there the kids are always going to be far ahead of you know because they're using it for everyday purposes and maybe not always the ones they should be using them for <laughs> yeah but we're at the beginning I think you know of a journey that we hope I hope that will make our life easier going on you know, that there's, I, I just know I'm really excited to find out more now. Whereas before, I was just putting up barriers and saying, Oh, I don't want to know, we'll just, we'll just not bother, you know, because it was just becoming for me really stressful and um, just didn't know what to do and blah blah blah. So I was putting up barriers and just saying, No, oh, like Jerry was saying about the phone, we'll just get a basic phone and a basic this and a basic that, and we'll not bother with anything else. But now I'm kind of thinking. This could actually be okay, you know. What was an otherwise stressful situation? Um, it'll be okay, you know. Well, even um, for the points of I, I put things down and I forget yeah. where they are, and just having that that thing of basically calling the phone and, yeah, it, and, call and, it, and the phone then alerts me that it's it's yeah. nearby, you know, because it rings to me. You so. can say, "Hey Google, ring my phone," and um, it'll ring the phone, it'll make the phone ring without actually phoning it, so it just makes it make a sound, yeah. you know. Um, and, and then if we, if we lose it within, you know, we've figured out, or my wife's actually figured out how we can actually make it ring as well, you know, just to tell us so it can be somewhere in the whole house, because then my wife doesn't hear the it actually it ringing anyway, so basically at least I can, I can find her phone as well, and then she can use it uh, visually. So it's um it's wee, wee tricks that you're finding that are they are making things you know definitely making it making it easier but you know, mm. you know it's it's just keep on and try and practice and just try and keep keep that that in your head then to be truthful so becoming a bit more manageable I've got to say so yeah yeah so do you have any advice for other people with dementia or family carers who would like to use technology to assist them? Uh, I think, well, I think what I've found out so far is that, that you know, there's, there's a few, don't just take the first person that's going to tell you something that's going on. I think find somebody that's specific and then it can actually basically write a, a kind of book, book for you, you know, because I think it is very, it's very personal, even between my wife and me, we, you know, we, we have different needs. You know, and for uh, contact and uh, talk to other people, and I think uh, don't 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 go out right away and um, and buy something because you you may find out you know if we did initially you, you spend a lot of money on the phone and then you know at first then you, then you, right. then you try it if yeah, you can yeah you get someone who's uh, basically have there's a uh, well, like a resource centre where we were down in uh, Helensburgh, you know, they have like a kind of tech bit there, you know, and then you can ask about it and you can find out a bit more information and then someone can talk to you about it or and other, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a couple of different places that you can pick up technology. But I mean, you think, you think you really you've got to try it out, be able to try it out, you know, and try it to see if it works for you and then get people to make it work for you the easiest mm -hmm. way that you can for you. It's going to cause you... Other than that, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a lot of money, you know, for something that you might end up actually sticking in a pocket, you know, in your your cover. I mean, everybody, for me, everybody had loads of advice to give us. All different people had loads of advice. For example, I phoned um, Vodafone. I went on to them for, to ask for advice, and they have got technology that can help us. But they didn't have anybody that would say this is exactly what you need, and this is what you know specific. 
to you. So ha- getting in touch with Alzheimer Scotland and, and you guys, you've managed to sort of give us just a single point of contact that has made it easier for us to say, right, if we've got a question, we can just yeah. go there. Or uh-huh. we've got having a single point of contact is just amazing, you know, and having that one group you know, I mean, we could jelly. We've got a we've got a twenty year old daughter who can give us advice. We've got a neighbour across the road who's got loads of technology can give us advice. We've got, but they don't know what Jerry's specific needs are. You know, and yeah. and you guys are aware of that. You know that. So that for me, I, I would uh-huh. get it's advice from the right people. Go to yeah. the right. Go to Alzheimer Scotland and ask them to point you in the right direction That's or right. whatever. I don't know, yeah. but. All, all the, I, I just got so stressed out with going to Virgin and Vodafone and all the different companies individually myself and I just got I just so having getting one just getting one point is has been really invaluable that's the only advice I would really say uh-huh. uh-huh. and don't be scared don't be scared to try things you know yeah. give it a go um because it's a great feeling when you get something to work uh-huh. and it's you know, that you've thought hasn't worked or wouldn't work and you think it's something daft that you're doing, which it probably was, mm-hmm. something daft that you were doing, but it, to get it fixed is just brilliant, yeah. And would you say that having that, that one thing working now, that, that win that you've had has given you more confidence to think mm-hmm. about adding more technology in? Yeah, absolutely. It's neat as well as thinking about it and, you know, also having a trusted person now that actually you're sure that actually basically try to fig- figure out your specific circumstance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just makes you feel a bit better. You know, it's, I mean, basically, it's, it's like I basically like get out and buy, I can't say you are like running a parallel or buying a car. I mean, you, you don't know where you are, you don't know what you're getting, you don't know where you're at. And then when you find the right person, you just basically want to hold on to that. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you just feel as if you're, yeah. you're getting, <laughs> you're getting the five star treatment. You know, it's like, you know, and the thing is, you know, it sounds daft, but before I was thinking, is there a way you can still get an old dial phone that you can just turn the number and you get, you know, and it's, it does very little, but at the same time, it just seems to me that before it was like having a, I would, I'd rather have a tape recorder and all that, whereas now we've got technology, you know, it's rechargeable, lasts longer and it's, it's doing a better job for us, definitely, definitely. But I say the main thing is, having the person there is it's, it's putting it to onto your specific uh, usage. And Jerry's sister got him um, about a year ago when he was really struggling to use music and music's Jerry's thing, you know, he loves listening to his music all day and um, he's got a lot of CDs um, uh-huh. and he was struggling, what he had done before he put it on, he had an iPod, an old iPod, they put some of his music on an iPod, but he just wanted to just be able to listen to a CD and... Um, for some reason, we just couldn't get it to work. So she bought him a, a really good um, Bose um, CD player, but it's also got Bluetooth and it's also got all sorts of things. So I'm sure we'll be able to get that work, working. It does. But no, it's no, just it does. sitting upstairs gathering dust. You know, she went out and bought it as a present. But now you can happens. go, hello, Google. Uh, yeah, can't do that. Above and beyond, thanks very much. Yeah, it comes yeah. on. It's just and nice. now, now it can do. It's fantastic. Yeah. You know, it's just it's, it just gives you a good good feeling. I mean, I can sit down and have a bit of peace anywhere, and I can I can take the music in my phone. Mm-hmm. It's not obviously going to sound like a big set of speaker system, but just when you get a little bit, mm-hmm. even you're walking the dog, you know, and then you can listen to that, and it's you know, it's it's just it's it's, it's using a multi multi tool now that it, it does. It does its work and it does your play. So that's what I think. So it's, it's great. I heard the dog earlier on having a wee um, chat with us there, trying to get involved uh-huh. in the chat. Uh, you were telling me before that you, you take the dog for a walk and the dog the dog takes you home again. That's pretty much it. I, I, <laughs> uh, sometimes I've done that before. If I, I mean, I do, sometimes it's... Uh, it sounds very daft, but I mean, I can go out and actually turn around three times and then I'll be going where I'm at, you know, if it's, if it's a new place. And then I'll, I'll start to head in a direction, the dog's like, right, hey, come here, we're going the right way. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, no, it's good having that, it's good having, I've just started to use that, um, 
find my way home, which is on the Google as well. So that's that's quite that's quite easy after a couple of minutes, you know. So if I'm then as well up in the I think it's dark slightly. Have you which, managed to get that to work? Uh, yeah. Quite good. All right, so it gives me the general direction I'm heading back again, you know, and it's voice activating, telling me that I can I can head home this way or that. You know, it's it's not obviously like military spec, but uh, it will it will get me to home, get me to home, and then at the same time, you know, I can also phone my wife and say, you know, I'm, I'm on your age. Like, Where are you? You know, I says you've been out for three hours. You've only been out for an hour. You know, so it's uh, just when I get not if Andy's with him, Andy brings him home. That no, the dog. I mean, when I get the dog, <laughs> put a light in his head. Room. That'll be the next time. We might not. Go that straight, Dad. I think technology is a way forward. Yeah. As I say, but the main thing is setting, I can't say it so much, it's just like uh, getting the right person, getting the right thing, basically, basically like the doctor writing out your, your your prescription, you need this, you know, and and, and it makes a big difference to you, you know, it's just, if it's not as being your, your head just Actually, feels Actually, you're a good analogy, Jenny, it's just like, it. it's like getting the doctor to uh -huh. write a prescription, it's like, it is getting it. It's getting it right, you know, and that mm -hmm. and that's it. And I mean, it's, it's it's much better than having seen sparks coming out of your ears, you know, when you're trying to get home. You know, it's just so stressful. So, so I'm I'm for it. <laughs> Good. It sounds like you've come full circle from considering um, using really simple things mm -hmm. to now using voice assistants and. You know google and you know considering lots of different technology that you can use now yeah definitely well it's, it's opening me a bit more because at least when i'm doing something if if i'm just trying to learn it and i'm getting a wee bit of a result i'm getting a result you know and uh, there's always a bit of a result uh, and, and i feel that i'm i'm still very slow in picking up on it but i still feel a, pl a positive rather than a negative on it now so that makes me feel yeah, you're not so scared of it now so i'm not so scared of it no that's good and I definitely the voice the voice technology suits me you know right down to the ground you know as i mean i say if it becomes slightly dark i can't find the keyboard on the phone so i can if, I, if it's even say it's lying on the ground i can go hey google where are you or oh, dial home you know and then or where are you? And it rings up, you know, and it's, so I mean, basically, right, I, mean, I can find the phone and minimum I can get somebody on the phone if I was lost to get mm -hmm. me home, you know, and then it doesn't, it means that if it's, I guess, if it's in the dark, I don't get stressed out, you know, and I mean, it's the stress you want to keep down as well as the application of getting you home. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Thanks so much. That's yeah. been fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences with us today. Um, I'm sure everybody will be really interested to hear how you're getting on, and I think we might need an update at some point. Uh, that'll be fine. I'll, I'll cut down this beard a wee bit more for the next. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you reflection about their experiences and to Nicola from Alzheimer's Scotland. So we are running over time so please bear with us because we've still got a really fantastic um, discussion to take place with Ron so please hang on with us and um, there's still more to come. So it's now time to hear from Ron Coleman. Ron and I first met um, when he and his partner Karen travelled to Glasgow to one of the Life Changes Trust gatherings way back in December 2018. And needless to say, we've never looked back. He's been a huge support to the work of the Trust through the work with their regional event in the Western Isles um, back in September 2019, and then to our recently hosted Dementia Activism Week in September 2020. Ron um, uses technology, and in particular, um, Alexa. And on the 18th of September, um, the Trust launched his peer-to-peer -peer resource, A Guide to Alexa. So Ron is going to talk to us a bit more about this and his experiences now. So over to you, Ron. Thanks, Erling. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, first, can I say, I, I use Alexa for everything. The one thing I don't use, um, technology as it could be used, is in phones. And uh, my my mobile is a brick, you know, and my kids call it a brick. They say it just 
It, it basically phones and texts, and that's it. And the reason for that is that it's more physical than um, being able to um, use it because of memory or anything. But I still have a, the back of my phone has a button that will immediately call my wife first uh, if I'm in distress or anything. So I can phone my wife. So even there, there's a bit of technology. Alexa and me um, is uh, the title of this presentation because I live with Alexa. I uh, have her around the house 24-7. I almost see her as a person rather than uh, I, I, I embrace the idea of artificial intelligence being part of my house. Um, in fact, I want uh, eventually to have the whole house AI, including things like the fridge, uh, the freezer, all those things, so that ordering and everything can be done um, by using my, um, well, I use a show. I use an Alexa show or my Kindle Fire to, to get in. And in my house, there are about um, six or seven Alexa devices. So no matter where you go in the house, you'll be in reach of one. And the one in this room, I've turned down because, of course, the minute you say Alexa, she gets very excited and wants to start um, engaging with me. I, I, I've been listening with fascination to a lot of the things that were said today. And I was thinking uh, when I was on the last session and Nicola was talking about um, Alexa and how they use it, that like her, I looked at all of the different possibilities and came to the conclusion that for me, Alexa, was the way forward. And the reason for that was that, unlike some of the other platforms, I find using the Alexa community to help me resolve issues really helpful. The fact that there's a big developer community that you can access and you can say, look, I'm trying to do this, anybody got ideas? And they'll, they'll suddenly get um, an email back saying there's this app. And then you can go connect to it and find a solution. And I think it's important that when we look at how we do things, that we try to find integrated solutions. So having different bits of technology doing different things although it sounds fine, I actually find being able to control that techn technology from a central hub like Alexa really, really um, useful. So the way I went about it was, uh, and it's reflected in Alexa and me, I used essential lifestyle planning on myself. I looked at my routine. I looked at my morning routines, getting up, what I needed, how I did that. And then I programmed that into Alexa so that Alexa can, every morning at eight o'clock, if I wish her to wake me up, uh, play my favorite music, which is a bit of heavy rock, um, we put the kettle on and do a whole host of other things that will help me get out of bed. And uh, I use Alexa plug and all those kinds of other gadgets that, that you can use. I think also Alexa is brilliant because the, the initial use for me was actually to help create a virtual memory. You know, because um, the, the, for me, there's two kinds of memory. There's uh, a virtual memory, which is uh, information. And then there's my memory, which is, tends to contain a lot more emotion. And sometimes when you forget things, the virtual memory can click you back there and help you regain the emotional content that we quite often lose as we go on this journey. 
Um, so part of Alexa and me is looking at your whole day, but not just one day, looking at it over the course of a week. Because we don't do everything exactly the same every day. Uh, my morning routine might be exactly the same, but after that, it changes. And my bedtime routine might be exactly the same. Um, so having a virtual assistant takes out the realms of care. And I think that's important for me in terms of autonomy and makes it about... Um, my election is about Ron Coleman. It's not about anybody else. So, it's an, so using routines and using other apps through um, the the Alexa uh, through the Amazon community, we we can actually live in our house and keep our autonomy for longer. For example, I I could uh, I connect I can connect to my local shop. I don't need to go into store and the shop and order online what I need. He will deliver it and it will be Karen might pay for it because I'm no very good with money. Um, and that would be done all by voice. So I can say, Alexa, I need Alexa shopping, put on milk, put this on, put that on. I so that was Alexa coming in there. I turned her down, not off. Um, and when I tell her to um, send that shopping to our local shop, um, it will send the shopping list. They receive it. He'll make it up, bring it down to me, and Cam could pay for it. And that's not a problem. And that allows my partner, um, Cam, to have her time where she can continue her career. Because she's not finished her career yet. You know, um, and I've not finished what I'm doing, but uh, I, I, uh, what I do want is to be able to spend time uh, not being a burden to anybody. So the fact that my wife can continue working, she can continue doing things, she can go places um, and not worry about what's happening to me because uh, we're, we're refurbishing a bit of the house at the moment and there's things that are going to happen in there like um, the, the ring alarm bell, but also a motion centre that we can put in, that if I get worse, uh, my progression continues, she might, she would be able to see that I've left the house and speak to me using um, drop-in from um, her own phone. So for me, uh, all of that's important. So that, that's just a general thing for me about Alexa. And just before we go, I'm going to ask Alexa to do one thing for me. Alexa, put the kettle on. Put, use plug one. Yeah, okay. So plug one, put the kettle on, and in so 10 minutes... Find a device name. Uh, in a minute, 10 minutes, my tea will be hopefully ready. Fantastic, Ron. Absolutely fantastic. And as always, it's a real pleasure to talk to you about all the work that you're involved in, but in particular, you know, the real benefit that Alexa has had in your life and has given you that, you know, that autonomy empowers you, as you say, to, to be leading and driving um, your own life rather than, as you say, that kind of being cared for aspect. So thank you so much. So just stay with me a minute or two, if you can. There's just a couple of things I wanted to maybe ask you before we begin to close in. Um, so a guide to Alexa has been launched and it's now on our website and it's accessible to everybody. So what would you like to see happen with that guide? What would be your hope in terms of that being used or... Or whatever, what do you hope for a guide to Alexa? 
I, I hope it will help people embrace the idea of uh, person-centered planning. Um, because I do think the way to individualize technology is through, if you like, uh, templates we already have. We don't need to recreate the wheel. We have things like um, essential lifestyle planning, path planning, maps, whole host of things. We have narrative ways of working. So all that stuff's in place. And what excites me is that we can then add technology to that. But people have got to be given, the, I suppose, the freedom to use it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think the good thing about the, the, the guide is, or the peer-to-peer -peer resource is, that it's like a workbook version, so people can personalise it and adapt it to their own needs, and you'll be able to see that. And I know Deb has posted the link on the chat to that. So going back to, I think this is a question that was asked of Jerry and Moira. So if someone was unsure about technology, so let's say Alexa, for example, given that's what we've talked about, but, though, but knows that they're needing something, what would your message be to them? I think the first thing I would do is show them that first film you showed today, mm -hmm. because I think that shows how people can get excited. Yeah. Um, because I, I, like most people, when I was told I was having cognitive problems, I, I thought it was the end of my world. And uh, I, I've discovered that, yeah, my world's slower now, but it's certainly not the end. You know, so yeah. give it a go. Yeah, there's no right or wrong in this stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Ron. What a way to end a fantastic webinar today and, and to hear from people that are actually using technology and the difference that that's making to their lives. So thank you, Ron. Um, and that now marks the end of our webinar today. I just want to say a huge thank you um, to Ron and to Jerry and to Moira um, for their contributions today and also to Henry and Pat and, and Jordi, um, who were um, the stars of our film at the beginning of the webinar. To all of our speakers today, our facilitators, and everybody that's been involved in developing and planning um, Dementia Whole Life Approach, the Technology and Dementia Learning event. It's been a pleasure to chair this today, um, and I think it has really given us some fantastic learning to take um, back to our respective areas, to our families, and as individuals as well. Um, we will email everyone next week, um, post-event email with lots of information, links, um, a recording of the webinar, links to the individual films as well that you've seen today, and just everything that you will need in terms of taking that learning further. Um, we will have a dedicated page on our website for that, so that the links will take you to that. Our social media will also promote it, and we'll have it in our next e-bulletin as well. So it's without further ado that I say thank you and um, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your day and thanks for bearing with us because I know that we were running over time so thank you everyone goodbye <laughs>